Good evening and welcome to Heritage Baptist Church. If you would stand and sing with me number 216, Beulah Land, dwelling in Beulah Land. Nick, would you lead us in opening prayer, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us back here safe tonight where we can praise you and worship you. Heavenly Father, help us to always put you first and make pleasing you our deepest desire. Thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. Holy Father, be with our missionaries and please keep them safe from persecution and keep them healthy where they can successfully spread the word of your son, Jesus Christ, and share the gospel. Be with Israel and keep them safe and please deliver them from all their troubles. Be with this country in the direction it's headed in. And thank you, God, for all our many blessings and help us to always be a grateful people to realize how blessed we truly are. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and his shed blood and the grace it provides. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good deal. We are grateful. That great. Thank you for praying, that, Brother Nick. But pray for our missionaries. I, like I said, I get a lot of letters from them. Um, I'm going to do something right now when my announcement time here real quick, praying for this. I'm going to announce, first of all, Kylie, will you come up here for me, please? All right. I have two $10 gift cards to McDonald's. Okay. And I'm giving them to Kylie. Oh. There you are. Now, she is going to, after church, check all the teens and young people's church notes, and she's going to give the best one, one boy, one girl. Okay. 
on a team or other, and you're in charge of that. If you don't have a way to take notes, you need to get it out right now. So, okay, get your notes out together. Uh, please don't use an envelope. There's all kinds of junk stuff in the back. And you, if you want to go get something in a pencil, you can do it right now. Okay, so I'm serious. She's going to take care of that for me. And then <clears throat> the next week, whoever wins the note rent gets to preach the same message over from their notes. And so it's going to work really well. We're going to, well, I was going to add the adults in that, but then I miss you in church. But uh, we're, we're glad that you're with us tonight. We're, we do want to, he's praying about that. I just got a letter this week from one of our missionaries. And I'm trying to figure out how, he, how he's pulling it off. But he has to, to baptize, they have to sneak people out of the country into another country. It is now a death sentence to baptize a Christian in several of the countries where we have missionaries. One or two in Africa and Pakistan is now that way. And so there are little pockets of Pakistan uh, where they've been able to reach spreading the gospel. And it's pretty, um, it's becoming extremely hard. Just keep them in your prayers. Think about that, the, the death penalty for baptism. That is a, uh, this won't be the first time the world's seen that. You understand that. It, back before the Reformation, it was a death penalty to leave the Catholic Church. A lot of things in it and do, do things in it. So uh, everybody has something. Everybody's in it. You say, well, is, does Islam really teach that? Most of those are made up rules. Later on about somebody else or things to go, okay. And so we'll, I'm not worried about all that. I'm just worried about our missionary safety. And just keep them in your prayers. If you think you're praying too much, you're not. And they're facing a lot of different issues. Then you got the ones who have natural disasters in South America and Central America and right now from those things going on. Uh, the uncertainty, Mrs. Uh, we're talking just a little bit with one of the ladies before church about, yeah, you know, China owns the Panama Canal now and has for years, okay? And so... Uh, <clears throat> they're getting ready to get their equipment across. They're having to redo it because it's not quite big enough to get huge battleships across. It will be when they finish, which is a good thing, amen? For them, you, the whole world is in a chaotic situation and uh, they're doing, there's things happening in the world that if we knew it, scare you to death. Watching what we do here at home is kind of scary, isn't it? And just keep, Praying for all and the churches, it's really harder and harder for churches in America to stay functional and moving. It is not as easy as you as we make it look sometimes, or you think it is. So just ask God to give grace to us and help people stay faithful here and on the foreign field. Um, uh, there are super dedicated people out there. If if you can't find a missionary story that stirs your heart, you're not looking. <coughs> For, thou for, for a thousand years, we've had people doing things that are almost unreal, believable. And, and I don't know, I, I don't say a whole lot about a whole bunch of different things, but do you understand five or 600 years before, at least 500 years before we started having official missions work in America, the Catholic Church was sending missionaries to the New World and they started and walked, uh, this guy's just going by themselves. I bet they didn't get much letters, many letters out. They didn't get much support. We, we were actually benefited a lot from that. Do you understand? Uh, you, you can hear what you want to think about. But, you know, when we got missionaries going to different places, they were already used to being in a building. They were already used to sitting in a chair. They were already used to somebody preaching and teaching to them. See, we didn't, a lot of things we didn't have to start over with. We just used what was already there. But in the meantime, we have missionaries everywhere. We support a lot of them. I wish I could keep every letter out in front of you and I wish you'd read them. And I guess I could send you every one. If you want to get on the list of every missionary that we get that sends us something every month through our website, we'll be glad to send them to you. You need to get your own. You need to keep it separate because um, now I don't know if I can do that or not. Anyhow, so we got too many the other way. But right now, just keep them in your prayers. And you say, well, how in the world? Do you do that? Don't know. All I know, it's because of God's grace and your generosity. Amen. That's the only two things I can figure that make it work. Okay. And you say, well, how do you how do you manage it? 
I don't have a way to manage it. We support them. When we lose one, we take on one. When we need to remove one, we take on one. God takes care of all of that stuff. And we know you can't spend what you don't have. We stay within whatever budget we keep out there. And, and then uh, that doesn't count all the extra stuff that we do different four or five times a year for other things. But uh, by the grace of God, we're sending the message around the whole world. So we appreciate your faithfulness in that. So with God's grace and your giving. If I had a third G, I'd stick it in. I can't think of anything. Okay. All right. Father in heaven, what a, what a privilege to be able to serve you. And Lord, I'm, I'm excited about getting to heaven, find out somebody that I helped send a missionary to. Lord, you keep an account of what we do. And you understand what we make possible. And you understand, Lord, what you're doing with what we're sending. That's, that's your responsibility and our reward. But Lord, you said if we just gave a cup of cold water, there's a reward for that in the right situation. And so, Lord, help us as we sacrifice, and I know a lot of our people do, to be able to make that possible. Bless them here, and Lord, bless the, the money that goes out. Bless our missionaries on the field. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage them, strengthen them, keep their families strong. Lord, keep them from the harshness of the world and Satan's attempts, Lord, to stop the gospel message. And I pray that your blessings would go there. The angels that you send before them, may they stand up in front of all that iniquity and all the hate. And may the story of Jesus, the grace of his love, be demonstrated in front of the whole world. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing number 91, What a Day That Will Be.
with joy in my soul, cause I knew my Lord had control. Well, I knew I was walking in the light, for I'd been on my knees in the night, and I prayed till the Lord gave a sign, and now I'm feeling mighty fine. Well, I'm feeling Jesus all the time. We're walking and talking as we climb. We're traveling a road to the sky where I know I'll live when I die. He's been telling me all about that land and he tells me that everything is grand and he says that a home will be mine. Dr. Ballas, look with me in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. All right, chapter 2. Uh, uh, <laughs> good, beautiful song. Done wonderful, ladies. You really, really did. That's a moving song, isn't it? Uh, how many of y'all, I tell you this all the time, you, we're wanting to go to Beulah land, and that becomes something special because of the Scripture. The word Beulah means married. I'm already in Beulah land, all right? <laughs> I have to be blind, no one out, right? <laughs> so I'm not saying anything. I'm just gonna. It's good to know those people in the back, back there. That's uh, most of you know Charlie and Sandy, and this is their. Uh, their, their I'm just saying he's the best boy they got. Let's put it that way, right? That's right. And so, and his wonderful bride there. They've been married how long now? Thirty-two years. They used to ride our church bus in Fort Worth when they were little. And a tremendous opportunity to know them and watch them grow. And uh, he and her have been an integral part of their church in Kokomo, Indiana. And he's a deacon there, served and worked. And I'm telling you, a good deacon's sometimes worth more than two pastors. Okay, but uh, not not I got to give you any ideas. But they're they're very important. Um, in an age, their average. How long has your pastor been there, brother? Thirty-five years. Yeah. That's unusual, um, and if you think about it, you got guys like him and me that were ranking right up there close to the 47 years mark, something like that, 46, 47, okay? But the average pastor moves. I'm not talking about all the other kind. I'm just talking about Baptist preachers. They, they move about every three years. Uh, so if that's the average, and you average in two guys like that, and Brother Holmes who stayed 44, Brother Taylor stayed 46, uh, just, you know, somebody's moving a lot. And so if I was moving that quick, I, I wouldn't even get to know your name. I said, never mind, I'll be gone before I know. Amen. But, you know, all that goes with it. There is an advantage to both of those for moving pastors, and especially 
you know, our church is an independent Baptist church, and so it's on its own. Everything you see or everything that works, there's no outside financing. There's no convention group. There's none of that. That is, you say, well, do you like that? We do that primarily just because it allows us to function the missions the way we do and operate our church the way we do, all right? It, there's no doctrinal benefit to it, and there's sure no monetary benefit to it. It is a detrimental monetarily. Financially, it'd be way easier to have a large group, and there are things you could do and would make life a lot easier. One of them would be insurance. Woohoo! Amen? The, just to be able to, to think about that. But God has all kinds of places for all kinds of people, and uh, we're a, kind of a mystery to start with. And when you go through the book of Revelation, he has the mysteries. Well, there are seven great mysteries. I'm not going to get into those uh, in, in the New Testament. And they have to do with the calling of us and our salvation and our service and things we do and the future to come and what's going to happen. But you know, what it, what it takes to keep it going is people, like we're talking about, who stay faithful consistently. Moving people don't accomplish a whole lot. It is to being able to find a place, be planted, stay there, and accomplish what God's put you there for. In the book of Ephesians, chapter number two, uh, I want you to look there with me, if you would, please. I got my little string thing down, and we talked about this in, in Ephesians. Is an, and and you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, and we talked about a little bit about uh, where in the time you walked according to the course of this world. Now, did you see the change right quick? He's, number ver, Verse 1 is about salvation. Brother 2, 2 is Christian life. And you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's the devil, in case you don't know. And the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the fl our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were of our nature the children of wrath, even as others. We talk about the, the wrath of God, and we don't like to see that. We like to talk about the positive things about God's love, about His mercy and how His grace is. Do you understand that all His love never ends? This is a strange thing for us. Because in our human nature, we want to say if we love, then we will only do good. In, in our society, it's gotten so bad, that means I, because I love my children, I will not even discipline them. And this, the opposite, is the truth. You, you want Bible verses for it? I didn't think you'd need them because they're there. You know how you demonstrate the love of a father? You go back and listen to James. Our fathers disciplined us. And goes on to say about different things. That if you don't get disciplined from the Lord, you're probably not the Lord's. I, think about what I'm saying. All right. We, we live in a society that doesn't believe in any of that. Just let it go and it's going to turn out. Well, it doesn't. Everything we're doing, it, it has to have effort put in it. We sow things into our life. And we expect to reap those things into our life. Amen? Amen? Right. All right. Everything we do has consequences. Everything we do have a, has a consequence. may not be a very big one, but it has a consequence. How we live, how we react, how we do. And Paul's telling you, number one, in, that you're saved. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now we're saved. We're, we're, we know the Lord as our personal Savior, and we're on our way to heaven, this is cool, wherever that's at and whatever it is, I only know one really cool thing about heaven. When I get there, I'll be able to be in the presence of the Lord forever. All the things of the sorrows and the sin and everything else of this life is going to be passed. And I don't know much else. Neither do you. You say, well, we're going to get there and we're going to walk down the streets of gold together. And are you sure? Or are you talking about the new king, the new heavens and the new earth? Where are we going? We'll leave here. We're going to go, go be with the Lord, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. I got an idea. 
I, only place I can tell you where heaven's at is where Jesus is. Heaven is where Jesus is. And that's where, if we know Christ is our Savior, that's where we're going. And you say, well, you know, I want to know more about it and I want to make sure it's worth going. The alternative is you die and go to hell. I'm telling you, if I have to live in the shoebox for eternity, that's way better than living in the fire for eternity. And unlike most people, I didn't get saved to go to heaven. I got saved so I wouldn't go to hell. I didn't find that out till later. You have to go to heaven. Isn't that a good deal? Woohoo! You get both. Great package. Way more than I expected. God saved us. And he saved us from hell and to himself. Now, he's going to start in verse number two with you saying, that where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. He's fixing to tell you, you got to change your walk. God expects us to appreciate our salvation enough, love him enough for saving us, that we're willing to change our walk. I just lost half of you. Well, I'm, you know, I'm glad to be saved, but God better not expect nothing out of me. Amen? How's that working for you in your relationships in the world? See, it doesn't work in the world, does it? We, we understand. If you really are in Beulah land, you, you hadn't understood that at all, and you're working that way. Your, your Beulah land is not heaven, I'm telling you right now. But according to the principle of the error, error, the spirit that I work in the children of disobedience. That's not what I want to guide my life. I've got a new king. I've got a new savior. I, have, I belong to a new family. I'm going to go into a new place. i got a new life with a new father. I don't want to go back to the old. I don't want to go back. Among whom also we all had our conversation. That's the way we lived. You say, well, yeah. Everybody lies. You're not supposed to. Everybody can't be lying if you're serving God because you're not supposed to be a liar. You, you, don't, you don't know where that verse is, lie not one to another. That's a New Testament verse too. So you're not supposed to be a liar. You're not supposed to be, you're supposed to be different. I mean, we all had our conversation times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. When I got rid of the, when I lost that wrath hanging over my head, I should have lost the desire to live what caused the wrath. If I'm a new creature in Christ. You say, well, I got saved, but it didn't change my life. Then you didn't get saved. If any man be in Christ, he is a, a new creature. If being saved didn't change your life, you must have not got saved, or you're in absolute rebellion to God, one of the two. Do we have to do anything to be saved or stay saved? No way. You don't have to do that because you're saved by grace through faith. But I'm telling you, those little verses like, let your light so shine before men, means what? That we're supposed to look and act and sound and work like we know God. That's part of our life. Let's look at it as we go. And you had it quickened. What's it mean that he made us alive? Quickened. Made us alive. You ever read the book of Luke chapter 15? All right, three stories in there. The Bible says, that all those people out there, and this is why we tell people that if you're not saved, you're lost. That is, you, you don't have a hope. You don't have any kind, of, any kind of promise of anything. You don't have any payment for your sin. You're lost. Now watch what he said. Three times, he said, if a man have a hundred sheep, then he lose one of them. And do, don't he leave the ninety-nine, go to the wilderness, and go after that which was lost. See, that's where we were without Christ. We were lost. We sing that song, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Right? When he had found it, he lay it on his shoulder rejoicing, cometh home, called together his friends and neighbors, saying, come with me, rejoice, for I found my sheep was lost. 
And you see what he do? I, he cooked the lamb and they had a dinner. You know, that's right. But he got the lamb, right? That's terrible, right? Right? I know, I'm trying to wake you up a little bit, okay? Here's the second one. Either a woman having ten pieces of silver, she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, sweep the house, diligently seek till she find it. That's called a revival. If your house is dark and dirty, you probably need to clean it up. And she loses the coin in her house in the dark and in the dirt. She lights it up. See, that's what a Christian life is supposed to do. And when she found it, she called her friends and her neighbors said, for I found the piece which I lost. She lost her sheep and she lost a coin now. And then the third one in that series is when the man with the two sons. For my son which was dead and is alive now, he was lost and he is found. That's where we were when we were not saved. We were lost. No direction, didn't make anything. You can say, well, you can go any way you want in life, but none of them lead to God. None of those things lead to God. Once we were dead spiritually, but not anymore. Have you ever been in a black, anybody ever been in a dark room? Okay, when I was, when I was, went to the University of Florida, they, they had these weird people teaching, doing weird things back in the early 70s. And they had this um, a class. I don't know what it was. I guess it, I don't have a clue what it was, but I had to take it. It came with my engineering. I'm not sure what it was for, but you had to take it. So we took it. And uh, in one of the classes, I'm sitting in there. Okay, you got to realize where we are and what I've been, where I've been, what we're doing. All right. You got a whole bunch of people in there that barely know where they're at. And because I know they didn't know who they were because they, they'd walk around campus and come up to you. And, who am I? And why am I here? I, I don't know. And I'm not sure about the other either. OK, but anyhow, I used to tell them, look at their driver's license. They could see the picture of themselves, know where they were. But she had she had this deal. She, they closed off all the windows in the classroom. And this is what she said was going to happen. We're going to turn off all the windows. Close all the windows. We're going to turn off all the lights so it's pitch black dark. And we want you to discover other people just by touching them. I, I don't know, because when she turned her back, I went out the door. She was in. I just left the room. I'm not real fond of people putting their hands on me anyhow. You know, and it wasn't the right time in my life for that in either. But I want you to understand this, guys. Okay. That's, that's the world, the way the world thinks. There's, you know, you're, you're experimenting at a level that's going to cause nothing but destruction. That's what lost is. If you've, ever, how many have ever been lost somewhere where you were absolutely lost? You couldn't find your way home. You couldn't, you're at, all right, you, you got to stop. You got to stop and figure out where you are before you can find where you're supposed to go. All right. When you go to the book of Peter, in the last point of the book of Peter, Peter says, those that have done these things, he, he said something really, it took me a long time in studying the scripture to understand this, and that uh, we lose not just our sense of what we're doing and where we are, and this is not in my sermon, so you got to look at it with me. The book of Peter, okay, and second, uh, Peter, excuse me, first Peter, uh, and I'm looking for where I'm supposed to be. Um, at here, but Peter talks about what, what we're doing. And he says this, you know, those that have not figured this out have a, a problem in their lifetime without, they don't know where they're at and they don't know where they're going and they don't know where they came from. Now there's a problem because if you don't know where you at, you're at, I can't tell you how to get anywhere. I've got to know, you have to know where you're at. My dad came to Texas years ago and called me and he said, you know, George, I can't find your house. How do I get there? I said, I don't know. Where are you at? And he said, I'm buying McDonald's. That helped. <laughs> In my hometown, that we had one McDonald's and everybody within 40 miles knew where it was. 
That wasn't the way it is here. You say, well, I'm buying McDonald's. Good. Now tell me where you are. That's kind of in the world. You understand? You got I can't tell him how to get to my place until he tells me where he's at. And you've got to realize where you're at in your Christian life if you're going to try to move forward and do anything with it. Where are you? Where, where did you came from? Peter said that you've forgotten where you came from. You don't know where you're at and you don't realize where you're going. You don't just keep wandering around. If you ever take any kind of survival training, they'll tell you that is the worst thing you can do. Stop! Figure out where you are. Pick a point and go one direction or the other. But wandering through life is not the answer. They'll find you dead in the wilderness or they'll find you lost in the world and you'll be lost for eternity when you don't put that application in your lifetime. Jesus said this, Verily, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter to the kingdom of God. There's a starting place. And it starts with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you heard the gospel as a child, God bless your heart. You got to jump on us. But God saves older people too. God saves people who've never heard as well. For those that are visiting, listen to me. We have a kid in our church. He's not a kid. He's 40. But he looks like a kid. He's saved. You know how he got saved? He's in Tehran. Tehran, Iran. Somebody handed him a Persian Bible. He, can, he is Persian. And he read the book of John and got saved. Don't know who the guy was? Todd probably might, might have met the guy. And don't know anything else. Just read this book, went home, read it, and saved. Okay, what are the odds? It's a death penalty for having a Bible there. It's a death penalty for going to talk to somebody about Jesus there. And the reason the kid is here is because he told somebody he got saved. And he's here to keep from being dead. Isn't that good stuff? What does it take for a person to know the Lord? Well, he can tell you just like I can tell you. And if you know the Lord, you know when and where you got saved. You might not know exact date and all those things, but you know when you trusted Christ as Savior. You say, well, you know, the preacher, a lot of things in life I just don't remember. Like my wedding, I don't even remember going there. How's it working for you? By the way, whose kid is that? Oh, that's yours. You don't remember having them, do you? See, none of that works. Not in our life. It doesn't work with your Christian life. And, I, and I've met people, actually, I'll tell you a story sometime, not tonight, about a lady that I met at the Canadian border one time that had a severe accident and had no back memory. And let me know what she was suffering. An absolute inability to know anything. You don't ever want to be like that. You're better off with all your bad memories than no memories at all. Know where you are. And where was it you got saved? How? When was it? All right. Know what you are now. And we're moving forward to this Jesus said, marvel not at this. You must be born again. And I'm persuaded there are a lot of people, guys, listen to me. They're churchy and they're, Christ, they're religious and there are a lot of things, but they're not saved. I think we're going to be mystified at the number of people when Jesus comes who don't go. Probably some of the better folks in our group. But they're not saved I try to tell you the stories in my life to tell you that I had a father he said that he was 10 times better than me and I told him no you're a hundred times better than me but you're not saved and he never got saved till the next year see there's a difference in that you, you got to know that you know your Lord and such were some of you and now, look what he said in the scripture verse. We're talking about that. We're not lost anymore. We're born again. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. 
But see, you're supposed to be in the Spirit. Go, did you go back, look at your Bible, and the Scripture says, but the natural man, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, receiveth not the things of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he discern know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Jesus told the woman at the well, she said, well, we worship here because our fathers, you Jews believe about Jerusalem. He said, the time is coming when it won't make any difference. And, you, and the scripture says in John 4.24 that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You can't do that when you're lost. Because you're not spiritual. See, we, we say spiritual, you know, look at that guy. Boy, that man is really spiritual. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I don't care if he glows in the dark. If he doesn't know Christ as his Savior, he doesn't have the Spirit of God. And once we trust, the Spirit of God comes in our life. It seals our soul. In whom after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And that's pretty much what these first three verses have to say. I'm, I'm going to show you something that I came up with a long, long time ago. And Cyril Sumner gave me a pretty good, sum, one of the better things, didn't match mine, but it was the same lines about things that happen. You, you understand, we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. If, if you were blind, and I said, look here. I know a place that has hundreds of millions of dollars just laying and you're blind and here's a map. You can go find it. You can't because you're blind. When you're lost, you're blind. I once was blind, but now I see. That's the second verse. Right? We have the light of the Lord Jesus Christ because we have the Spirit of God. Now look at that. To be converted, and this is what we're going from, this is it, hang in there now. To be converted means to be changed. How many of you have some kind of converter? Almost all of us use them. You say, I've never used one. You got a cell phone? You're using one because you're plugging something into a 110 outlet and it's converting it to 5 volts so you can charge up your phone. It's converting it, a converter. It's different on the way out than it was on the way in. You say, I don't believe that. Take your converter apart, hook it straight up to the two wires and stick it to your phone. You'll find out <clears throat> it's way different. Of course, your phone will be running and it'll smoke, but it, it'll be interesting to see, right? When we were born, we had three parts. God made us three parts. In the book of Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you, W-H-O-L-L-Y. That means all of you. Holy. Not, not anything to do with being good or bad. Holy. And pray that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is a great verse. Are you ready? I have a little girl that Cheryl never got to see. And she's in heaven. I did. How come babies get to go to heaven? Because they have a body and a soul, but because they have never become accountable, their godlikeness is still attached. When God said, the day you eat thereof, you're going to die. That's the part that separated the spirit. Babies that die under the age of accountability. You say, well, how do you know that? I know what David said when his baby died. 
He said, I can't bring him back, but I get to go to be where he's at. It's good enough for me. Amen? Now watch this. That's the way when you were born into the world. This is what happened when you sinned. You lost your God-likeness in all the fellowship in the whole world. And everything and every religious thing you could do could not restore that. You couldn't serve God. You couldn't walk with God. You couldn't fellowship with God. Does God hear lost people? Absolutely. That's how I got saved. He heard a lost man call on him. Can God answer lost people? God's God. He can do whatever He wants. I don't have any doubt of that. God has answered a lot of prayers for a lot of people. Done a lot of things. That's His job. But I can tell you right now, when it comes to being able to go to be with Him when you leave the world, you're not going to do it if you're spiritually dead. You who are dead in trespasses and sins. That's what He's talking about. You have no godlikeness. You must be born again. And Jesus talked up that Nicodemus about the spiritual thing. Remember? The spiritual spirit. He said, Nicodemus trying to figure it out. We well, can't see the spirit. And Jesus said the most ridiculous thing. He said, no, you can't see the wind either, but you can see it blow. You see the cause of it and you see what it does in the world. Think what this would mean. Paul said this, and ye he who hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins in Ephesians 1, 2, 1. In Romans chapter 7, he said, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. See, the problem with the law, you didn't have to know it to be under it. To the Jews, the law was a blessing because their covenant law included a way to roll their sins away. We didn't have that. The only thing the law did to us was condemn us to death. And that's what it does today. When we got saved, when we got saved, the God likeness that separated you from Him changed you. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. David said in the Psalms, for all those who shall, that men that shall be created. When I read that, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit over the top about the accuracy of the Scripture. And I almost left the, first, the church I was saved in, and I've told you that because I hadn't been there two weeks, and I've been working and reading and listening to things, and God created everything. Okay, I'm putting that straight in my mind. That wasn't what I was taught all my life. But the preacher started preaching a message said, Next week, I'm going to preach a message about the people before Adam and Eve. I waited after church. I said, there are people before Adam and Eve? He goes, well, I'm going to preach about it Sunday. I said, no, because if there's people before Adam and Eve, then the whole Bible's a lie, and I'm not coming back Sunday. Well, I'll just come back Sunday. I said, I'm not coming back. And he goes, well, really? And he turned over the Proverbs and he said, the answer of people. I said, that's stupid. Excuse your pastoral privilege, but that's stupid. If there were people before Adam and Eve, then the whole salvation plan doesn't work. Wherefore, by one man sent it into the world, therefore, by one man who is perfect, salvation could come to a whole world. If you mess up that plan, if evolution's true, you're, you're worse off than the dinosaurs because you're dead now. Our whole hope is on that prophecy that God would make new creatures in a new covenant with a new name for us. The scripture says in the Psalms, in a name that no one knows, but I shall. Guess what? We're called Christians now. You don't think God knew that? For a first five, go through that book of Acts. We were, they just called Christians that way. That way. I didn't want to be called that way. You know what I mean? Did y'all get that? That way. Where are you at? That way, Baptist church. See, I just don't like that. There's something, something really about it. But we were converted. We were changed. 
And guess what God did? In whom after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This is important to me. Sealed means I can't get out. And nothing gets in. It is sealed. I did something a couple years ago just to see if it really worked. I took pinto beans and I put them, you know, the big bags of pinto beans. I put two of those in a five-gallon bucket and sealed it. And it sat in the church office for probably three or four years. Huh? Longer than that? Yeah, okay. Kylie remembers she played on the buckets when she was a kid, didn't you? Yeah, okay. Anyhow, I opened them up. You say, what'd you do? I opened them up. I took a bag of them home, didn't tell Cyril how old they were, and said, cook these. Because you know ladies, she said, well, this has been in a bucket for six years. You're going, I ain't eating them. So, so you don't tell them, amen? It's chicken. You know what, right? <laughs> Guess what? They tasted just right, because as long as they were sealed in that bucket. Now the problem is, plastic doesn't last forever. Glass doesn't last forever. Rubber doesn't last forever. And, and anything we seal up here, even a metal can doesn't last forever because it'll rust through eventually. There's all kinds of things. But we have a seal that's not possible to be destroyed because it's the Holy Spirit Himself. Now, I understand a lot of Christian people I know are beating on the inside trying to get out. But you can't do it. You can make your life miserable as a Christian by trying to live in the world. But you can't ever be happy that way because the Holy Spirit is never going to quit dealing with you. He's never going to quit working on you. That is a great blessing. Do you understand that? Oh, I put God's always on my case. Thank God for that. Isn't that good? God cares about me. That's what happens when you trust Christ as your Savior. You got the flesh separated from the soul, sealed by the Spirit. So when the flesh dies, I get to go straight to be with God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now I'm preaching to a whole bunch of people that know exactly what I'm talking about and you've heard it over and over and over. But the majority of the people who know that and tell that's the doctrine they have in their life don't believe it. And you say, how come? Because you're telling me that the Spirit of God is inside of you and you're no different now than you were when you're lost. Doesn't make sense, does it? Can't be. If any man be in Christ, we're a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And you're not going to believe this, but this is what the chapter's about. That spiritual, spiritual man in there is going to start working on the inside out on the physical flesh you have. And He won't give up until the day you die. Remember my verse in Philippians? He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day, what's the verse say? Of Jesus Christ. He's going to finish it one way or the other. Either by working in my life here as much as He can or taking me there in one swift move, fixing it. If that's true, and it's true in Christians' lives, do you not think that you ought to be different than you were before? 
I do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a privilege to know you as personal Savior. And I pray, Father, that you deal with our hearts. Lord, I'm thinking that if the God that I worship and the God that I know and the God that saved me lives on the inside of me, there'll be a little bit of that light shining through somewhere in the way I think, in the things I want, in the places I go, in the people I hang out with. Well, it'll all make a big difference. If God's on the inside, that Spirit's going to deal with me constantly. Paul's telling these people, these Ephesians, that you were lost, but now you're found. You were dead, but now you're alive. You were without God, but now you have the seal of God on the inside. Help us, Lord. I'm praying, just begging. I'm pleading with you. I'm watching the world around me fall to pieces. But there's not a reason that a Christian person in the middle of the greatest turmoil of all time cannot still walk with God through it all. Help us to turn loose the hand of the world and grab a hold of the Spirit of God and say, Lord, teach me. Use me. Change me. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me just a minute. Richard, would you lead us in closing prayer, please? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just give you the glory and the praise, Father, for who you are and your holy name. And we give you the thanks for allowing us to gather together to worship your name. And Father, as we learn more about your word and your spirit indwells in us, Father, let us adhere to what your word says and follow it through. And Father, we just ask you to be with the missionaries as they go about their business, Father, and be with Israel as they go through their turmoil. And Father, be with our country as well, Lord, as we go through our chaotic turmoil here as well. And Father, we just ask you to go with us and keep us safe out of harm's way and that you heal the sick and bring them back to you. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.